Hello, this is Miss Dagenford, and I wanted to give us a nice review for the structure of the ear and mainly the physiology. Some of you were gone, and I wanted to make sure you, you caught this material. Now, if you want to hit pause and make sure you have all of the structures and notes down, you are welcome to do so on this page right now. Okay, so if you did that, uh, because I'm going to go pretty fast in the first beginning here. So the outer ear, you notice on number one, the function of the pinna or the auricle is to just trans transmit sound waves. It's going to be uh, caught by your, or the cartilage and then sent down the ear canal. The tympanic membrane is covered by skin on the external surface and then mucous membrane on the internal. The key here is what it does, what it does in response to the sound vibrations. Sound waves make the membrane vibrate and as it vibrates it's going to go up against the three bones of the ear now before we hit that right after the eardrum we have the eustachian tube which is also called the pharyngotympanic tube now some people like pharyngotympanic because it tells you where it is the pharynx is the throat the tympanic would be the ear i'm used to eustachian tube Whatever works for you is fine by me. It connects the middle ear with the oral cavity, and when you climb um, up a hill or a mountain you, or an airplane, you feel your ear pop. That's because the pressure is equalizing. So <clears throat> let's move on to the middle ear. The middle ear, uh, what we're going to see is the sound waves being transverted or converted to a mechanical energy movement. Now, you musicians, you're familiar with the opposite. You make something vibrate in order to create sound, but it works the other way. Uh, sound waves can make things vibrate. If you've ever been in a movie theater and you hear that wonderful deep sound as the uh, sampling of the, of the sound waves for the sound system comes on, you can feel the shaking of the seats. So, how does this happen in the ear? Well, the tympanic membrane vibrates. That's going to set the three ear bones vibrating, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Now, they're all connected to one another. So, number five, the malleus is connected to the incus, which is connected to the stapes. And the, and the stapes fits inside the oval window, which I'll show you in a bit. The ossicles are going to transmit those vibrations, that mechanical movement. And it's also going to... Um, fit into the oval window which is then has fluid on the opposite side and not only do we transmit the vibrations but we want to amplify the vibrations with the bones and that's because fluids hard, harder to move so you really really want to get stronger movements um, into that fluid now in the inner ear we're going to have the we're going to have the cochlea. The cochlea is what we want to look at. Now, we're going to look at a picture in just a bit, so I think you're going to understand that far better when you look at the picture. But we have three tubes inside one larger tube. And so we have the superior scala vestibuli, the middle scala media, this is also called the cochlear duct, and then the inferior scala tympani. Now, both of these have fluid inside of it. The vestibuli and the tympani have paralymph which means around, and the middle scala media contains endolymph, which means inside. So that's going to help you. Now we're going to, number nine I circle because that's going to really be important here. The cochlear duct contains, the middle one, contains a membrane on the top of it, and then that sits on top of stereocilia. Stereo just means that we're going to see movement. And they, and they run the length of the cochlea. And that's then we're going to see a basilar membrane underneath. That's going to be really key. Look out for that in a bit. So we'll come back to the physiology sound. Let's make sure we get this picture down here. So here's our bony labyrinth. We're going to look at the semicircular canals and the vestibule in another video. Let's focus on the cochlea right here. Now, what they're showing in this picture is imagine if you were to take a slice of that cochlear duct, uh, I'm sorry, the cochlea, and then if you were to look inside of it. Now, I'm going to make mine a bit of a mess. You don't have to follow my example. I, you'll see what I'm doing in a second. Notice you've got one, two, three, uh, well, two and a half properly. So watch. If I circle this, let me get a thicker line here. There we go. If I circle this, 
and that one, and then connect them together. Notice what we have is that first one. And then let's do that again. Notice we have that middle one. And then if it curls around one more time, so that's where they're getting those curls. So each tube is, is made of three smaller chambers, the scale of vestibuli, the scale of media, and the scale of tympani. And then it repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats. So in actuality, what we end up having is if we were to unroll it, now unrolling it is not possible because it's surrounded by a bony encasement, but imagine we could, what we would have is the scale of vestibuli that is continuous with the scale of tympani. And inside we've got this tube made, filled with fluid, the scale of media, and that's going to have the organ of corti in it. Well, what in the world is that? Well, let's go ahead and magnify it. And again, you can hit pause if you want to make sure you get everything down. And if you did that, what we have is our scale of vestibuli, the scale of media, and then this basilar membrane, which I've highlighted right here, that bottom part, and then the scale of tympani. Now, all of these are filled with fluid. You've got the paralymph on the top and bottom, and then the endolymph inside. Now, if you've ever been to a wave park or a wave tank at an amusement park, you might be sitting on a nice floaty over here, and, and th as the waves go by, you're going to respond to those waves. You're going to bob up and down. Well, the inner ear is similar to that. You have this basilar membrane down here on the bottom, and sandwiched in between the tectorial membrane, you have these hair cells, which have cilia that are just touching that tectorial membrane. They're, uh, they're, they're, their little stubby ends are kind of rubbing up against that. So that's going to be really key because we've got this basilar membrane and then the tectorial membrane and fluid. So you can imagine as the um, stapes is connecting to the oval window behind which there's fluid. So as the stapes vibrates, it's sending ripples down the cochlea. Now, here's what's kind of cool the basilar membrane is going to resonate. Now, resonating is a physics phenomena where um, materials respond to a vibration by, or, or responds to um, a frequency by vibrating with it. And it's uh, a rather cool, rather interesting phenomena because only a certain frequency can cause a certain material to resonate. And uh, it's um, really fascinating that this happens in the inner ear. So let's examine that further. Um, and let me scoot back. If you wanted to make sure you got the information about the sound, that might have to be another video. But um, you probably remember that from your physical science days. So let's talk about uh, what happens in the actual inner ear. When vibrations from the stapes hits the oval window, the vibrations set the fluid within the scalar vestibuli moving. It's just like a wave tank. The waves also disrupt the basilar membrane, and that's resonating at the appropriate frequency. And that's going to cause the cilia to bend, now, now that those are on the hair cells. The cilia bending is what ultimately causes the signal to be sent. Now, let's take a look at that basilar membrane. Let, let me use this picture, and I'm going to make that a little bit bigger and maybe clean that up a little bit just before we do this. Now, the basilar membrane, if you kind of take a look at it from the very, very uh, top of it. So imagine you're looking down at that. So let me make sure we clear, get that clear. So we're going to take a look at this basilar membrane right there. But we're, and, and you got to realize that this is actually kind of extending back along the, the, co the cochlea. And so um, as it does so, if you could look at it from the top, you would notice that the basilar membrane is actually a different length. And if you've ever seen a xylophone or the inside of a piano, you might sit there and get this flash of inspiration that we've got high frequencies here and very low frequencies on the other end. And this is exactly like most string instruments, right? Um, you see the violin versus the cello and the bass versus the piano keys, the very high ones, the very low ones, the xylophone. So here's where the resonating comes into play. Because if you 
have a very high frequency note, 20,000 hertz. Now, a lot of us lose these high frequencies as we get older. So maybe for some of us, we might be here for the high frequencies. But if you get a really high frequency, what's going to happen is those high frequencies and those frequencies alone will send this area rippling and, and resonating and vibrating. And because it's going to be that certain area that's going to have those hair cells that cause the cilia to bend, we're going to send a signal saying, oh, I hear that frequency. And then if you have a, a, a nice low note, uh, that's also going to have some cilia responding because that area of the basilar membrane is resonating with those vibrations. And then those cilia are going to send a signal off. Um, and then maybe you have that nice middle C. Now, um, if you were really good with your frequencies, you might notice that I'm prob I'm not being very precise here. So if you're sitting here looking at mine going, that's not middle C, I completely concede the point. My, I'm trying to give a relative position here. Um, so musicians don't, <laughs> don't think too hard at what I'm doing here. Um, so if you have a nice middle note here, that's going to cause that area of the basilar membrane to resonate, and then that's going to cause the the cilia to bend, and then you're going to send it off to the brain. So imagine you're in your music class or choir class, or you're just listening to your favorite song. Uh, they hit a high note, low note, middle note, but then let's say they, they hit them all together in a very nice chord. You would see if they're hitting that chord, all three areas would be rippling with that resonating frequency, with those resonating frequencies. They all send a signal to your brain, and then you get that nice sense of, oh, I recognize that chord, that's a, you know, and, and, um, and then the brain is able to kind of put those all together. Now, what does this look like over here? Well, here's our uh, cochlea run out, our unrolled. The high frequencies would be resonating this area that corresponds to that one. And then if we take our middle area, um, that would correspond to that area in the cochlea right there. And then the low note would be at the very end. So here it is kind of in a nutshell. The one, um, sounds that are low in pitch stimulate the hair sound cells at the end of the cochlea, whereas sound waves that are high stimulate the hair cells at the base. And so then the complexity, the com combinations will then give us the sounds that we know. Now, this picture on the left gives a nice holistic view. So number one, the tympanic membrane vi vibrates, the ossicles vibrate, the scale of a stibuli vibrate. Here's that oval window, that interface between the bones and the fluid. And so that's vibrating against that fluid in the scale of vestibuli. And that's where we get our frequencies, where we have our higher, middle, and then this one's too low. The 4A is too low. It's going to travel around. Uh, but the ones that resonate are going to hit that sweet spot on the basilar membrane. So hope that helps, and then you can always uh, ask questions uh, of in class. Uh, thanks a lot.